Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Hello and welcome to the Skeptic Zone. Richard Saunders here with you from the Bay Area, San Francisco. This is show number 328 for the 30th of January 2015. And for those of you who uh, take notice of this sort of thing, yes, this show is out a couple of days early. That's because when the show should be normally going out, I'm going to be somewhere, I want to know, between Hawaii and Fiji flying back to Sydney. Coming up on this week's show, we're going to kick off with Evidence Please with Joe Alabaster. Joe will bring us up to date on the Tenpenny debacle fiasco ludicrous situation. The tour has been cancelled, it seems of uh, Sherry Tenpenny, who's going to come out and tell people why they shouldn't vaccinate. Oh, dearie me. Latest news with Joe Alabaster coming up. And I can tell you in the United States right now, more and more outbreaks of measles. The anti-vaxxers must be so happy. Following that, I visit the National Center for Science Education in Oakland and chat to my old friend Eugenie Scott and the new executive director of the, uh, the center, Anne Reed, A really interesting interview. I uh, spent time with these two fascinating women at the uh, National Center for Science Education. Find out more with that interview coming up. Following that, it's a week in science from the Royal Institution of Australia, www.riaus.org.au. Then to round off the show, Maynard's spooky action. Maynard chats to Dr. Grant Hill Cawthorn, a medical microbiologist and lecturer in communicable diseases. Good grief. He's going to be chatting about Ebola. Find out about Ebola coming up at the end of the show. But before we get on, I'm really, uh, really uh, pleased to see that the, uh, the Morty skeptics down there in Victoria, just sort of south of Melbourne, wow, they are so active and they've got a great uh, lineup of speakers this year already. In fact, on February the 3rd, they've got uh, Dr. Ken Harvey talking about homeopathy. On uh, March the 16th, is our old friend Joanne Benamou talking about uh, human rights. And then on July the 7th will be Dr. Meredith Doig. So many good people. Look, just Google Morty Skeptics, M-O-R-D-I, Skeptics in the Pub, to visit their meetup page. And if you're in that neck of the woods, I reckon you should go along. But now it's time for me to... Hmm, Run to the fridge and see if there's any clam chowder left. Wow, if you ever visit the San Francisco Bay Area, folks, the clam chowder in the sourdough bowl. You eat the chowder, then you eat the bowl. Pretty damn good. Well, I'm doing that. I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. we want is some more evidence, please. Here's Joe Alabaster. Hello, this is Joe Alabaster. A couple of weeks ago, I reported on anti-vaccine advocate Sherry Tenpenny's planned speaking tour of Australia and the Stop Tenpenny campaign. Well, there have been some developments. And at the risk of breaking continuity, and potentially the space-time continuum, who knows, the big news first. On the 28th of January 2015, Cherry Tenpenny and tour organiser Stephanie Messenger announced that they had cancelled their series of Australian seminars. I left off my report on the 11th of January with news that all but two of the venues scheduled to host Tenpenny's events had cancelled their bookings. On January the 14th, Michael's Oriental Restaurant in Brisbane made the announcement that they'd no longer be hosting Sherry Tenpenny. Then on January 19th, an announcement appeared on the event page for the seminar to be held at Ridges South Park Adelaide, saying that the venue had cancelled the booking. From the Eventbrite page, quote, Important notice. The venue has cancelled our booking due to bullying by vested interests who do not believe in informed consent, free speech and respect for others' rights and who appear to support censorship of thought and science. A new venue is being sought now, so please book your ticket. You'll be notified of the new venue in due time. 
Thank you. End quote. Indeed, the organisers of the event were still encouraging people to buy tickets, despite the fact that every venue had pulled out. Meanwhile, those who'd already bought tickets to the seminars were left with little information as to what was going on. No emails were sent, nor announcements made beyond the one I just read, which was placed on each Eventbrite event page. The media coverage was equally as ambiguous. Tenpenny herself appeared on the Today Show, in which she referred to those who have campaigned against her seminars in Australia as extremists and mentioned that bomb threats had been received. In fact, Sherry Tenpenny has mentioned bomb threats repeatedly to the media. Bomb threats are rather serious and ought to be treated as such, and of course reported to the authorities for investigation. The bomb threat that I have witnessed, and several people have made screenshots of, was left in a comment on the Facebook page of Michael's Oriental Restaurant. I'm going to read it verbatim here, so I'll need Richard to step in with the bleep. Here we go. Quote, Nature will take its cause in you, psychopath, you dead f- troll walking. Too bad if the place gets blown up with a bomb. End quote. Now that's not an okay thing to say. Unfortunately, when Tenpenny has referred to the bomb threat, she's omitted mentioning who it came from, one of her supporters. The gentleman in question has a rather substantial history of making threats to vaccination advocates. Presumably he was angry at the prospect of Michael's Oriental Restaurant potentially cancelling Tenpenny's booking. Now, I'm not willing to judge all of Tenpenny's supporters by the actions of one person. All sorts of people take up causes without necessarily behaving in ways that are approved of by others who they campaign alongside. However, I am extremely disappointed that Sherry Tenpenny has decided it's acceptable to tell the media that bomb threats have been made without disclosing that they were made by one of her supporters. This omission, alongside claims that those who've campaigned against her seminars are extremists and terrorists, suggests to the public that one of her critics made the bomb threat, and I find this disingenuous to the extreme. Some media outlets have, unfortunately, run with the bomb threat story without diligent investigation. I'm heartened, though, that others have looked into the issue further, witnessed the threat itself in its context, and have reported accurately. The bomb threat was featured in a press release made by Sherry Tenpenny on the 28th of January, titled, quote, Dr. Sherry Tenpenny speaking to her cancelled for reasons of safety and security. End quote. You know, I've been watching the Stop Tenpenny campaign fairly closely, and I've not witnessed any threats of violence coming from vaccination advocates. If I ever do witness such, I'll condemn it incredibly strongly. Threats and intimidation are utterly unacceptable. Any such behaviour should be reported to the authorities. What I have witnessed are community members coming together to campaign against anti-vaccination seminars, which would have misinformed parents and parents-to-be on how to best protect the health of their children. They've done so via social media, petitions, letter writing to venues and MPs, collating publicly available information and blogging it, and engaging with the media. To then have that characterised as a hateful campaign involving terrorism and extremism, to be compared with the Charlie Hebdo killers in Paris and the gunmen behind the Sydney siege, well, how else are those who have had to back down going to frame their decision to do so? Claiming persecution perhaps fits their self and public images better than having to admit that an overwhelming number of Australians are willing to stand up and say no to the spread of misinformation that harms children. I'd like to finish off with a few excerpts from Stephanie Messenger's public announcement that the tour has been cancelled. To be frank, I find some of it a little bizarre, and I'm glad that she posted it, as perhaps a few people who came to hear of Sherry Tenpenny and Stephanie Messenger via the media coverage of the now cancelled tour will have a look at where Stephanie Messenger is coming from and find it a little less likely to be evidence-based. From Stephanie Messenger, Quote, with the pro-vaccine extremists running their campaign of hate, intimidation, bullying, sabotage of businesses and threats of violence, we could not in good conscience put the attendees, speakers and new venue owners at risk of violence and harassment. 
We are mindful that at each seminar there were already people booked in who were bringing babies and children along, and as we were all about protecting babies and children, we are not willing to go ahead and risk their safety. When you are dealing with extremists, you just never know what they're capable of doing, as we have recently seen with the Sydney siege and also the Paris violence against free speech. These pro-vaccine extremists are actually terrorists against free speech. They are against people accessing all information to make an informed decision regarding this medical procedure. They are in favour of human sacrifice, as they know some babies are injured and killed by vaccines, but think this is okay for the perceived good of the community. They are against people sharing whatever information they want, and therefore they are in favour of censorship. They believe bullying is acceptable when they do it. Venue owners were threatened, harassed and intimidated to cancel the contracts we had in place. This is bullying. Of course they deny all this, but please look to their actions. These speak louder than the words that they speak with their forked tongues. What you do and say in this world is a declaration of who you really are, and these people certainly made plenty of statements about themselves. Basically, they are low-vibrating souls who have behaved in rude, arrogant, vile, intolerant, controlling, abusive, manipulative and ignorant ways, and so have declared this is who they really are. They are so far away from the truth that they are trying to hold on to their ignorant and fearful position no matter what. Just know, as higher-vibrating souls who have learnt the truth, you can do much more to advance the truth for all to learn, by speaking out whenever you have an opportunity. End quote. That's about half of it. You can read the rest at your own leisure on the Gankin Man Foundation's Facebook page. And for anyone wondering, this low vibrating soul received an automatic refund for the full purchase price of the ticket, $79.92, from Stephanie Messenger via Eventbrite and PayPal yesterday. My name's Carrie Poppy. Hi, I'm Steve Colgan. This is Richard Saunders. Hi, George Robb here. I'm Jane Novella. I can tell you what I hate about QED. What I really hate is that it comes to an end each year. QED, for me, is just a wonderful opportunity to, to hear lots of speakers. Hearing the crunch of 350 people purposely and simultaneously overdosing on homeopathic pills for the 1023 event was a sound I will never forget. It's simply one of the better sceptical conventions anywhere in the world. And you're, you're asking me what I think of QED. I haven't been to QED. And also, because it's such a, a personable event, to actually meet quite a few of these people for the first time. Because you will meet many, many fun and interesting people. You will see great talks by some of the best thinkers. And you'll also meet people who have a drive and a passion for making the world better by protecting people and not being dicks about it. You're going to write down to people who I maybe wouldn't have heard of without QED Comp. I would be an epic guest because I could speak in a flawless British accent. Hello, everyone. Like that. And everyone would be like, who is this English guy? Uh, I, 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 are you inviting me? Because I'd love to go. QED 2015, April the 24th to the 26th in Manchester, England. 12 main stage speakers, 8 panels, 3 comedians, and 500 friends, and a massive party! Tickets are £99 or £69 for students for the weekend, including the Saturday night. www.qedcom.org to get your ticket. Hurry, it's in April! Again, I've found myself in Oakland. I'm visiting the National Center for Science Education. And as listeners know, I've been uh, visiting this wonderful place now for many years. And I always come and see my old friend Eugenie Scott. Hello, Jeannie. Hi there. Good to see you again. Good to see you again. And it's good to hear your voice again. But today I'm very pleased to be here to meet Anne Reid. Hello. Hello. Nice to meet you. And you're uh, the new kid on the block. Can I say that? Absolutely. It's uh, only the truth. 
And, it, and I see you've settled into this office very well. And you've got uh, quite a, a big job in front of you. I can imagine, oh, I can't imagine what it must be like. Uh, Jeannie, you've passed the baton, so to speak. Well, Anne is not really the new kid on the block. She's been here for almost a year. Um, in fact, I think the anniversary is coming up for, of the, the passing of said baton. And mm. The baton was not dropped. It was grabbed and run with down the block. So, <laughs> no, Anne has been doing a great job this last year. It's really been, uh, it's really been fun to see the organization developing in new ways and new ideas popping up all the time. It's been terrific. I'm, I'm so pleased to hear that. I'm so pleased to hear that because last time we spoke, you were just sort of telling us all about uh, your uh, retirement coming up, which it did, and I guess you're handling that quite well. I'm getting better at retirement. I mean, <laughs> it, the thing that people don't understand, at least I didn't understand, is that retirement takes practice. You, <laughs> you, have, you have to figure out how to not do things and, you know, if, at least somebody like me. I mean, I, but I'm, I'm actually, you will be shocked. You will be shocked to hear this. My daughter was shocked. I have been watching television. I'm shocked. I, to, I told you. I told you. <laughs> like I say, I'm getting better at retirement. Good for you, Jeannie. Oh, you're looking well, too. You're looking <laughs> fabulous. So let's get the, down to the business, so to speak, Anne. You're here. You've been here for roughly a year, mm-hmm. I guess. And, um, well, I guess it's a pretty open question, but how are you finding it? I mean, uh, is it as challenging as you thought it would be? Uh, It is challenging, and obviously it's difficult to step into the shoes of someone like Jeannie and to step into an organization that has had such a strong identity over the years and try to figure out how can I – what I keep saying is how how do I not break it? Um, (laughs) Good point. Good point. Um, It's the old expression, if if it works, don't fix it, right? Or something like that. If if it ain't broke, don't fix it, I think, yeah. Exactly. So really a a very strong um, imperative not to – not to screw things up, um, but also to try to see how we can move forward knowing that what I heard during the interview process and what I heard in my first months with the staff is that we know that we're only hearing the tip of the iceberg of what's going on in in U.S. schools with respect to bad science being taught or settled science being taught as controversial. So how do we get out ahead of that? How do we we get... um, out of the situation of just waiting for people to tell us that mm-hmm. bad things are happening and find out about them, um, make sure more people know about us, make sure we find out about more things happening, and ideally prevent them from happening in the first place. So that's really been what I've been working with the staff uh, on for the last year is how do we do that. I think that's fantastic. I mean, And we, we, we can't drop a stitch in time, saves nine <laughs> and an ounce of what is it? An ounce, ounce of, pre- of prevention. prevention's worth of pound of cure. Mm-hmm. You, you've really been you've been, really been reading your Ben Franklin, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, did you know that he wrote under the name of Richard Saunders? That's right. <laughs> I'd forgotten that. Poor Richard Zalmanek. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'd forgotten the. Never mind. We digress, but that's digress. unusual in this interview, isn't it? <laughs> Um, I, I think that's uh, uh, absolutely right. And just before the interview, we were just chatting about um, uh, anti-vaccination, which is a big issue, of course, in, in other spheres. And that's the attitude there, too. I mean, if we can, in that fight, if we can we, stop the damage before it starts, it saves us running around trying to fix sick kids in mm-hmm. that respect. Uh, so that's that's. I think that's absolutely the right attitude to have. And how do you think you've been going over the last year with that attitude? Uh, well, I, it would be nice to say, oh, well, we've, we've fixed it. Um, <laughs> uh, we haven't. But um, I, I just want to throw out some numbers because I think they're very striking. So um, there was a study by uh, Berkman and Plutzer uh, about five years ago now that looked at how uh, many biology teachers were teaching either creationism or teaching um, straight up teaching creationism or teaching um, – creationism as a valid alternative to evolution, so teaching both sides. And the numbers were really shocking. A very large number of biology teachers, I forget the quarter, exact percentage. A quarter yeah. to a third, kind of depending on how the question A was. quarter to a third? It was a little bit shocking, yes. Yeah. Wow. But even if you took the, the, the really worst-case scenario of their teaching creationism, I believe it was 16%. Yeah, it was, was lower. And was if you... Up. But even if you just take that and you multiply it, you say 16% of American biology teachers, which is 53,000, and how many millions of American high school students there are, are, and you divide evenly, which is 
not necessarily the case because some classes are bigger than others, it works out to about 420,000 biology students a year in the United States learning creationism instead of evolution. It's an absolutely stunning number. And we hear about maybe 100 cases a year. Yeah. So we're uh, clearly only dealing with the tip of the iceberg. So how do we um, flush those teachers out? Yeah. How do we identify the community? Well, we certainly know where some of these communities are, but how do we get at that? How do we make it so unacceptable that we start shaming these communities into not allowing that to happen. So we're going at it in, in a three-pronged effort, to reaching out to teachers directly, mm-hmm. knowing that um, most science teachers are doing a great job. Yeah. And they're doing a great job with very limited resources and with increasingly high demands on what they're expected to get across and how they're going to be assessed for it. They need to be propped up. They need to be told, you guys are the best. You are you are the foundation of fixing this problem in the U.S. of science illiteracy and 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 vulnerability to that kind of anti-vaxxers and other yes. um, anti-science people. It's amazing how it all ties in somehow. Yeah, yeah. Um, because anti-vax doesn't it, that doesn't show up in textbooks. It's not something that teachers teach in schools, but it's the same phenomenon. It's the slipping of the standards. It's it's once you let something in the door like that, it's easy for the rest of it to come in. I guess. Well, once you start saying scientists are just like any other group and they just say whatever is in their best interest and science. Science is, is not disinterest, disinterested science, is not impartial, then you really are on a slippery slope. Or oh, scientists believe this, but here's another point of view. That sort of thinking. Right. Yeah. Well, in, in that sort of equal time kind of thinking yeah. is something that, that we battled for a long time. And, but I think, I think Anne is, is uh, talking about something that's a little bit, of, a little bit deeper. It's about what I would like to think in the most generous attitude, a misunderstanding of the scientific process uh-huh. um, and how scientists go about doing their jobs. But I'm becoming more and more convinced that they're, they're really, we're, we're on the cusp of a shift to an attitude in a substantial portion of the population in which, just to, to use Anne's phrase, science is you know, just another way of knowing. I mean, it's it's um, no better or any worse than any other kind of way of, of coming to a decision about something. And, you know, for a lot of things, that may be true. I mean, science isn't going to tell us whether the Democrats' health plan or the Republicans' health plan is better. But if you're talking about something like vaccination or how better to teach climate change in schools or, or the reality of evolution... You ought to render unto science. I mean, science really is the best way of knowing for those sorts. And to the extent that there may be in American culture uh, currents that are attacking that fundamental foundation of confidence in science. Notice I didn't say faith in science. That's different. (laughs) But the confidence in science that I think has been traditional in in America. We've, you know, all of the surveys have shown for decades that Americans like science, they appreciate what science does for them, they like their science gadgets, they like grandma's new um, hip transplant, I mean, you know, they, they like the benefits well, they like of science. But when science impinges upon their ideological and emotional concerns, I mean, I, want, I don't want my baby to get sick. Yeah. And somebody comes up and tells me that vaccines are going to make my baby sick, and those scientists are all in the payroll of the big pharmaceutical companies yeah. anyway. Yeah, the old arguments, yeah. You know, absolutely. my, my uh, concern for my child's welfare is going to make me listen very seriously to that alternate point of view, even though... If, you know, somebody came up and said, "Oh, what they're saying about photosynthesis is wrong because all of the scientists, all of the botanists are on the in the pockets of big science, whatever they would say yeah. about photosynthesis." You know, it wouldn't matter to me. But my kid's health is important, yeah. so I've got an emotional concomitant to that, and it's the same way with climate change. It's the same way with evolution too. Well, that we get back to um, the matter of uh, creationism, especially. And I could imagine some parents would say, well, my kids or my religion is important to me and therefore it's important to my kids and this is what I want taught to them in in the schools. It's the old battle, isn't it? One of the reasons we know that there are so many hundreds of thousands of students learning about creationism is because teachers were surveyed, biology teachers were surveyed about what they were teaching. And we found as we were trying to figure out what to do about um, climate change denial in the classroom that we didn't have any good data 
on what was being taught and, and how it was being taught. So we are just now gathering the results of a survey that was done in the fall of 8,000 middle school and high school science teachers about what they're teaching uh, about climate change. And we are uh, hopeful that that will give us the kind of deep information that we need to know what what is what problem are we facing in classrooms? Where is it happening? Um, is it a problem of people being children being taught that climate science that climate change isn't happening, mm-hmm. or is it children are being taught that it's not settled science and that it's controversial, or, or are they being taught good solid science on the topic? We just we just don't know, but we hope the survey will give us those answers. It's interesting because back home I get the impression a lot of the opposition, the way they'll couch it is that, uh, oh, it's not settled. Oh, and some scientists think, this is this creationism all over again, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's, it's fascinating. It's, it's, like, it's almost like history repeating itself. Yeah, it's the same, um, I, we call it the science denial playbook, and you can practically <laughs> follow along with each kind of objection that they're going to come up with, whatever the kind of science it is. And, and that one is you can never have enough evidence. Yeah, um, to, yeah, to convince someone. Absolutely, and the same with the vaccine. Right. It's it's amazing. What do you call it? The science denial playbook. Mm-hmm. Oh, that should be a real book. <laughs> <laughs> that should be a textbook for skeptics. That's good. I like that. Okay, there's an idea for you uh, listeners out there. Get to it. I want to just backtrack a little bit because mm-hmm. I only talked about one one leg of the stool, the three legged stool oh, yes. we're building. Um, so that that being the teachers, uh, that they we would like them to know that we have their backs and that we understand the role that they play in the, in the scientific enterprise um, and support them in that. And at the same time, make sure that they are doing the right thing. Make sure that they know that it's not appropriate to teach climate change as a debate uh, over the science. Um, so that's one leg. The other leg is the scientists themselves, and not just the evolutionary biologists and not just the climate scientists, but the entire scientific community needs to recognize that when, as we've just been saying, when science is attacked in one sphere, it affects faith in science, confidence in science in general. It hurts the brand, to use sort of oh, an yeah. advertising term. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. The, the society of, uh, you know, the American Chemical Society, which is a supporting organization of NCSE, um, the physicists, the molecular biologists, the um, meteorologists, the dentist, everybody who uses science in their profession needs to recognize that this kind of anti-science talk hurts them, even if they're not attacking their particular area of science. And a lot of scientists really don't know how to help. They don't even know how to talk to deniers. Big point. Good point. Um, uh, we, we discover this absolutely back home with, with uh, getting the message across. Mm-hmm. And you can know your stuff. I know a lot of good skeptics and good scientists who certainly know their stuff, but it's that... Uh, that communication that is what it's called. Ethereal <laughs> communication, that skill, that yeah, t- yeah. technique, that, uh, which is practice as well, I imagine. It's, it's practice, but it's also a set of... Uh, it's, it's hard to say. It's, it's a skill... Um, there may be some people who are just inherently clearer communicators than others, but it's something that everyone can learn. Yes, and, right. uh, yeah. and there are certain phrasings that you need to think about which communicate the way you want the information to be transmitted without c- communicating a bunch of, of, of maybe uncorrelated ideas mm-hmm. that actually lead a person into, uh, into uh, misunderstanding. So well, yeah, I think there's a, 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 even more fundamental than the fact that a lot of scientists are not terrific communicators um, is that they erroneously think that what they need to communicate is science, <laughs> and that's not the case in these yeah. in in these instances. That the way to convince a creationist that evolution is real is not to sit that person down and hammer them with evolution. Yeah, it's it's to take that step back and say. This is about your faith, isn't it? You feel that evolution threatens your faith. Yeah. Did you know that there are hundreds of thousands of Christians who don't see it as threatening their faith? Can you think about it as a, as something outside of your religion? Kind of the way the analogy that I've used that, that pe- makes people laugh, but I think it, it is helpful, um, is that it's like playing soccer. You're not allowed to pick up the ball. And in science, you're not allowed to invoke God. You can invoke God at, at church. You can invoke God in the way you understand the Bible. That's all fine. But if you're going to talk about science, you can't do that. It's not allowed. 
And so when you learn about evolution, you're going to learn about how scientists explain what's going on in biological diversity and without being able to invoke a supernatural influence. Mm. That's all it is. It's separate. Um, this is an old, old argument that Genie is a past master at making, but it's it's real news to scientists. You can sort of see this sort of light bulb go on yeah. in their heads that, yeah. oh, oh, I get it. And climate change is similar. It's not religion, but, but people who... Oh, it's almost... <laughs> it's ideology. It's, it's ideology. Ide- it's, I, it's politics. It's economics. Yeah. It's there yeah. are a couple of issues that we we uh, touch upon in the Australian Skeptics and the Skeptics and Podcast from time to time, which get uh, a reaction like none other. And climate change is one of them because people uh, will write in absolutely livid that we dare to uh, be on the side of what we consider to be the scientific consensus. Mm -hmm. And I've had people bail me up in our pub meetings, demand that we take on this issue. And I say, well, you know, it's sort of an issue we're interested in, but that's not where our our heart lies. And they get terribly offended, you know. But I think that's the same with with with, uh, any passion, any interest like that. Mm -hmm. So when you ask about, am I going to get out and about, the one um, community that I have started to get out and about with and will do more is the scientific community, which is really the world that I came from before coming here. So um, talking to scientists about how they can be helpful in this issue and not um, counterproductive yeah. seems to reach a, a fall on willing ears. Good. Um, and then the third leg of the stool, which we're just getting started, in fact, I just listed the position um, in the Chronicle of Higher Education is to do a pilot project to start science, community science booster clubs in local communities where parents and local businesses that care about an educated workforce, skeptics, humanists, anybody who's interested in the science education their kids are getting could get involved in these clubs and support their local teachers and informal science educators. So whether that means raising money to send their local teachers to the National Science Teachers Association meeting or have a community science fair where all of the schools can bring um, to a local auditorium what their classes are learning, um, just some way to make sure that people have a, have a connection to what their science teachers are doing and what their kids are learning in the hope, again, of flushing out the situations where it's not going well, but more importantly, supporting the places where it really is going well, which is going to be the majority of places. So um, I hope that that will really get me out to lots of communities that um, are interested in improving the science education in their towns. It's interesting because I I guess you being on the the front line, so to speak, and this is something that you're vitally interested in. When I think of the situation back in Australia, this was a big issue for us, well, 25 years ago, yeah, Even up to 15, 10 years ago, it was sort of still there. But to be honest with you, today it is – we could go for a long time not even hear this issue. Um, even in Queensland. Even in Queensland, you know, what we call the deep north. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm wondering whether that's because <clears throat> it's a cultural thing, whether because we're winning, I don't know. What would you, be your take, Jeannie? Well, you know, it's kind of hard for me to pontificate about Australia. I'm mm. not there. You're much better informed than I am. But it's a, it's a country with a small population relative to Relatively, ours. Yeah. Um, and I think when you have smaller communities like that, the presence of charismatic leaders is extremely important. And you sent Ken Ham to us. <laughs> and <laughs> seriously, he's, he, was, he was a major force. Yeah. in uh, Australian creationism when he was there and stimulating um, others to, you know, to uh, become active as, and of course he, he did stuff too, but, you know, and then he, then he uh, went east and um, came to the U.S. and cut his teeth at the ICR. And, and you're then welcome started, to him. Yeah, thanks, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Well, if we have a joke back home, we've sent Ken Ham here, but you sent us Meryl Dory, who's the <laughs> Australia's number one anti-vaxxer. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. We do owe you an apology, yeah. don't you? But actually, it's, it's even worse than that. Yes, you sent us Ken Ham, but that was payback because we sent you the uh, uh, Gish and Morris from the Institute yes, for Creation Research, yes. and they're the ones who's got everybody all excited about yeah, um, yeah. creationism in Australia, and then the rest is history. But you're right. <laughs> I, I get the feeling also from talking with other Australian friends and my, my 
infrequent visits, they wish they were more frequent visits to Australia, that the creationism issue isn't really the big deal. Not anymore. That it, was, no. yeah. well, it used to be. Yeah. When, when the Australian skeptics started in the uh, very early 80s, it was one of the, big, one of the bigger yeah. issues of, was, the, of the organization. Yeah, yeah It yeah. was one of the organizing um, conflicts, I think, that got mm. you guys started. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then there's plenty of other woo to keep track. I mean, one of the things that you guys do marvelously, and, and I should really sit down with Anne someday and, and drag out those videotapes, but is your, your work with dowsers. Um, because that is such a wonderful example of, it can be used as such a wonderful example of how science works. Yeah, yeah. Because what the Australian skeptics did on more than one occasion is they uh, worked with the, uh, the committed dowsers in Australia to set up controlled experiments. The dowsers agreed with the protocol, oh, of course we can find water under those circumstances. And, this, you know, they range from very elaborate to very simple protocols. But in all of the uh, tests that were done, there was double blinding which, of course, is such an important principle because it's so easy to, con to, f to fool yourself. We're yeah, human beings, yeah. and we're going to see what we want to see. But these were all double-blinded tests of whether these uh, dowsers who were, you know, find water all the time could do so under controlled circumstances. And, of course, the wonderful result is that in every single case, the dowsers did only as well as expected by chance which we knew they would do, but yeah. which it's lovely to demonstrate. I have used um, and recommended the Australian dowsing um, protocol, shall we say. And, and the lovely thing is that you can find videos of what went on and how they set it all up. And these are all on yeah, YouTube. Yeah, We've yeah. made them available very yeah. nicely. Well, just to benefit out quickly for the benefit of our listeners, if you uh, Google James Randi in Australia, which is the name of the documentary made in 1980, which is a famous set of water divining tests, or if you Google the mighty... Mitter Musta water divining test. Mitter, Mitter Mitter is a little country town. It's beautiful, but every year they have a fair, and we've gone there a couple of times to test the local water diviners, and that's quite fun. Or if you Google my name, Richard Saunders, and water divining, you'll, you'll see some tests up like that. But thank you, Jeannie. Yes, um, we're, we're quite pleased with those because they're a, a great way to teach people uh, basic science, actually. And the other thing that, that I've recommended them, I've recommended them to teachers as a way for teachers to teach things like con uh, scientific control, you know, holding variables constant, um, double blinding, um, hypothesis formation and testing, uh, because you can, you can uh, you know, have the kids think through themselves, show them a little bit of a clip, and then, well, why did they do it this way? Why did they, why did they cover the bags of sand or the bags of water mm. so that nobody could see them? And why did they have bags of sand as well as bags of water? And the students should look at, th well, because if it's a heavy bag, it's going to press down on the grass, and then that would, might cue you that there's <laughs> water. I mean, you can have the kids work through yeah, why yeah. these controls were set up. And uh, you know, teachers, teachers can really benefit from this sort of thing because teaching science as a way of knowing is usually done so didactically and so boringly mm -hmm. that kids just sort of memorize the, you know, seventh grade science well, five yes, principles and right. then forget about them the next week. Well, when we do that at schools, we do this water divining test in schools. The kids love it. They get to stand up with the rods and they walk along and see if they can find the water. Then it's blinded and the kids are screaming from the audience, go on, find it, and all this sort of thing. So <laughs> I, I, I get a, a big kick out of, out of doing that. Now, what, what Anne doesn't know is that uh, Richard and, um, and some of his partners um, will ha have a show that they do for um, public schools. Um, mm -hmm. it's the actually mystery a sort investigators. Of, yeah, mi it's, mystery investigators. Mystery investigators, yeah. right. It's like middle school and high school. Yes, but, yes. Yeah. And uh, they have this great uh, school assembly that they do that's mm. really fun. Oh, <laughs> you can come on my show anytime, Jeannie. <laughs> well, Jeannie and Anne, thank you so much for, for letting me come by once again to the National Center for Science Education. I um, love dropping by every well, time I'm here. I hope you'll continue here. to do so. I certainly sh could, you couldn't keep me away. You could not <laughs> keep me away. And I'll leave the final word uh, to you. You've got... Uh, uh, a big job ahead of you. There's no doubt about it. This is not an easy thing to do. It's not a hard, um, an easy nut to crack, is it? it? It isn't easy, but the vast majority of people support it. And I, I have been so stunned during this year that anyone who uh, asks me, and not just scientists, what do you do? 
And I say, well, we try to keep bad stuff out of science classrooms. And they, they say, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for doing that. So that's very, very heartening. And I know that if yeah. we can just figure out a way to, to engage and to enlist more and more of the people who already agree with us, I think we'll be able to make a dent in the problem. I think so. And, and this is exactly what the National Center for Science Education has been doing for many years. And if people want to find out more, what's the, uh, the URL they can visit? ncse.com ncse.com thank you again thank you hi this is Colm Ryan from Cork Skeptics in the Republic of Ireland here our next event Skeptics in the Castle features Michael Marshall recounting his ongoing adventures in the world of pseudoscience Michael needs no introduction to Skeptics he is the organiser of the QED conference in the UK, as well as the Vice President of the Merseyside Skeptic Society and the Project Director of the Good Thinking Society. He regularly speaks with proponents of pseudoscience for the Be Reasonable podcast, as well as co-hosting the Skeptics with a K podcast. His talk begins at 8pm on Thursday, the 5th of February. The venue is Blackrock Castle Observatory near Cork City. It's free to attend and all are welcome. We look forward to seeing you there. The Skeptic Zone is brought to you by Dr. Bob's Trivia Quiz. Visit drbobsquiz.wordpress.com and see if you can match wits with Dr. Bob. Welcome to A Week in Science from RI Oz, bringing you the science you need to know. 2014 was a massive year in science, but there was also some weird stuff. This week we're looking at the strange things that caught our eye. Kicking off our top five is the ancient crustacean, whose sperm is six times the size of its body. The tiny ostracod measures around one millimetre in length, but its sperm is nearly a centimetre long. The way it fits inside the miniature crustacean is by coiling itself up like a rope. And what I like to call hygienic homies comes in at number four. The fist bump is the most hygienic of greetings, transferring up to 90% less bacteria between people than a handshake. A high five was also more hygienic than the traditional handshake. So all this time Barack Obama wasn't only being super cool, he was also being hygienic. Ever wondered how much bacteria passes between people when they kiss? Well, now we know. Dutch researchers studied kissing couples and found that a six-second kiss transfers around 80 million bacteria from mouth to mouth. And unsurprisingly, this transfer means couples have a more similar profile of oral bacteria than two randomly paired people. And kind of disturbingly, they've opened a display in an Amsterdam museum where you can kiss your partner and find out your own bacteria transfer profile. At number two is a study which found the ideal cheese for pizza. Now we can't say move over mozzarella because it still took top gong, but we found out way more than we really needed to about how cheeses melt, bubble, release water and oil, and brown under heat. It did develop new techniques for studying food and cheese characteristics, and also gave us information on how to customize our own cheese blend for pizza. And the number one weird science story for 2014 is the revelation we might be hitting peak beard. This stems from a study that found that the most attractive facial hair a man can have is heavy stubble. But this raises the question, do these preferences change? Researchers found that as a particular facial hairstyle gets more popular in the population, it becomes less attractive overall. So rare is best if you want to be most attractive. That's our top five weird science stories for 2014. There's more information on the RIOS website, riaus.org.au. Follow us on Twitter at RIOS and like us on Facebook. I'm Ben Lewis and we'll catch you next week. Ad hominem, begging the question, factoid propagation, false analogy, false cause, false dichotomy, gibberish, immunised hypothesis, moral equivalence, poisoning the well, simple-minded certitude, stacking a deck, and WTF are just some of the fallacies we provide real-life examples of in Hunting Humbug 101, a podcast about bad arguments. 
check it out at www.skepticsfieldguide.net. Here's Maynard's spooky action at a distance. Well, it's time to get really paranoid now. It's Paranoid Corner with Maynard here. We have a doctor who is a specialist in... Oh, actually, what is your name? Why did you get your degree and what are you a specialist in? So my name is Grant Hill Cawthorn. I did my original degree in medicine because I wanted to become a doctor. I then became another type of doctor, so I did my PhD, and I specialised in infectious diseases and microbiology. Can I ask why? Why were you drawn to that as a field? It was uh, Originally, I was very interested in neurology, um, so I was interested in brains in general and how they work. And then I had a few cases when I was a junior doctor where it was quite clear that people with viral infections of the brain sort of fell through the gaps. It, infectious disease people didn't know what to do with them. Neurologists didn't. So I, want, I then specialised in infectious diseases to try and fill some of that gap in. Okay. And you're, you're going to be talking about Ebola here today because that's getting all the headlines and everything. Is, is that really anything we should even be vaguely worried about in this country at this time? In this country, there really isn't much point being worried. It, you might, we might get an occasional imported case here, but really because we have a first-rate healthcare system, we have good infection control, and people would be identified quickly, you wouldn't see any kind of forward transmissions. You wouldn't see additional cases within Australia. Uh, although that, that didn't happen in Texas. They, someone turned up at a hospital in Texas and they didn't recognise they had them based on their symptoms. What happened there? So there they had a very different setup in the US. So they, the person that presented to the hospital, Mr. Duncan, went to his local hospital and then was treated at his local hospital. And the problem with doing that is your healthcare staff at every hospital in your country isn't going to be trained to the same degree to use different types of personal protective equipment. So in particular, the nurses that were involved in his hemodialysis hadn't had any training. So they'd seen a half an hour video on what they're supposed to do and therefore weren't prepared. Okay. And uh, we're better than that generally in this country. So in this country, we took a different approach. We decided to designate special quarantine hospitals in each state. So if you present to the Royal North Shore Hospital and they think you might have Ebola, they'll isolate you and immediately send you to Westmead Hospital in Sydney for identification, treatment, etc. Because in Westmead, we've spent lots of time setting up two rooms to contain these patients. We've trained all the staff up, practised and practiced and so there's not the same risk that you you saw in the US. Look I would imagine the most dangerous thing would be an airborne avian flu would that be one of the most dangerous things we we could face as as a human race? Some some kind of flu. So it doesn't necessarily have to be avian flu, but certainly flu we know undergoes these huge genetic changes, so what we call uh, genetic shifts, where you suddenly have a version of flu that none of us have ever seen, so our immune systems don't know how to respond to that. And if it is capable of being highly transmitted, like the 1918 Spanish flu, for example, then that can have a dramatic effect on humans. So the 1918 flu killed more people than the First World War, mm. um, but isn't as recognised recognised by people and isn't as well known. So flu and viruses like that are the ones to be worried about. And what makes Ebola so uh, infectious in layman's terms? I was talking about how it's similar to hepatitis in transmission, but it's much more infective. Why is it? So what you tend to see in people who have Ebola, particularly when they're at the stage where they're vomiting, diarrhea, or even have the kind of bleeding symptoms, is they have very high viral loads. So in each milliliter of blood, there's huge amounts of virus. And that virus, if you then transmit, get some of that blood in your eye or in your mouth or your nose or uh, vomit or diarrhea or after they've died and there's virus on the body then it doesn't take much blood to actually get infected by that virus. The other key thing with Ebola versus, say, HIV, is it takes very few virus particles to actually set up an infection, whereas in HIV you need far more of the virus to actually set it up in your body. Have they got a clear cause as to how this uh, virus came about? Is it due to uh, the eating of bushmeat or some sort of transmutation that way? We know that Ebola lives within bat populations in Africa, and certainly it looks like the bats have migrated from Central Africa, where they were before, over to West Africa. So all of the genetic information Information and the epidemiology that's been done in Guinea, where this started, points to uh, a small town called Miliandu, where the parents were preparing raw bat, and their two-year-old child 
inadvertently got infected with Ebola and so that was patient zero if you like mm-hmm. and it's from there from looking after that child the impact on the family and then other people being infected that this has then spread and we've seen that with every Ebola outbreak is it seems to have spilled over from what we call the sylvatic cycle so animals out there in nature and this happens as we move into animals territories so in Guinea they realized after the war finished and they had a stable government they could now chop down the trees and they have a good sort of income mining moved in cleared lots of areas so you're suddenly getting animals constrained in one small area you're getting people becoming more reliant on that kind of meat and so you set up these systems for getting what we call zoonotic infections Mm. so infections from animals to humans could i ask you a historical question as an infectious diseases doctor um i've heard that the bubonic plague doesn't always match up with some of the symptoms of what the black death was do you have any do you have you heard about that at all yeah so what we call plague you're seeing pestis which is a bacteria has actually um, crossed over into humans multiple times so there's been some very recent genetic studies that have shown the very first Justinian's plague for example that affected and helped bring bring about the end of the Roman Empire was a former plague but that came from animals but very sep- separately to the Black Death which moved over into humans which is separate to the current episodes of plague that you se- see in Madagascar at the moment for example where there's a big outbreak so they're all cross species transmissions it's not yeah, that the plague sits around for ages right, so they're slightly different forms yeah so they're slightly different forms each time and so they have different propensities to spread human to human and so we see now the plague isn't as bad as say the black death or justinian's plague it's less virulent nowadays and um as an infectious diseases doctor are you a bit nervous when you go to a salad bar in a public area and that sort of thing no, most of the time. No. That, that's all well controlled. You, you, you don't wash your hands a bit more than the average person? No. I, I'm the Part of the working in infectious diseases is you know what the risks are. You know that you have a good immune system to fight these things. If you eat healthily, you keep your immune system primed, you get enough sleep, then you can deal with those kind of infections as they come along. I bet you, being at a skeptics conference, I bet there's one phrase you really hate where people say, you can strengthen your immune system. Yes, and we never quite know what that actually means. And actually, it's interesting when you think about things like pandemic flu or Ebola, that actually affects people with strong immune systems more than people with weak immune systems because it's... They react against themselves, is it? Yeah, it's all of the symptoms are because your immune system is reacting to the virus. It's not the virus itself. So actually, in pandemic flu, for example, all the deaths normally occur within the 18 to 40 age range where people have the strongest immune system. Mm -hmm. So yeah, strengthening immune system doesn't really mean that much (laughs) yeah and taking vitamin c doesn't mean that much there's nothing you can actually do to help is there really no it's getting a good balanced diet we know that vitamins in a tablet form just don't really work in the same way that they do if you get them in fruit and veg and in a good balanced diet so that's actually the most important thing okay does it really frustrate you with some of the popular media reports of the whole ebola thing or 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 anything really because they they just tend to get the wrong end of the stick and then beat around the bush with it Yeah, and it is always a big risk. And actually, with the current Ebola outbreak, the questions have always been about what does it mean for Australia? What does it mean for the United States? There's very little concentration on the 15,000 cases that have occurred in West Africa, the 5,000 deaths. So that's where our attention should be, not what's the impact on us. And of course, I imagine you wouldn't be a big supporter of uh, sending some homeopathy over there, really. No, and that's one of the things. <laughs> we've, we've actually seen homeopathic practitioners go out there, mm. and these countries have wised up to this and are trying to stop visas. They're trying to bring about bans. We, we see the same thing with silver preparations, lots of going around about that. And the FDA has had to consistently send out cease and desist letters to these companies to try and stop this misinformation from going about. Look, we'll get out there on stage and, and spread the critical thinking to Yeah, that's the idea. We're trying to dispel myths and try and get the focus back on West Africa and get an aid to them rather than worrying about all of this, these myths and legends that surround Ebola. I guess the term is evidence-based. Yeah, we want both evidence-based medicine, and that's what we're pushing for in treatments, but also evidence-based policy. So we need to think, should we be banning flights? Should we be screening incoming passengers? Should we be quarantining people when they don't have any signs of infection? These are the kind of things that have been set up by certain governments where there's no evidence base for them, and it's not good practice. So we need evidence-based policy along with medicine.
Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. And thank you for the people writing in saying how much you enjoy our new reporters, uh, Joe Alabaster and uh, Heidi Robinson. More from both of those wonderful ladies coming up in the coming weeks. And thank you to those people who are buying the Vaccination Chronicles DVD by visiting www.skepticzone.tv, scrolling down on the left there and finding the link. $12 posted anywhere in the world. You'll get the DVD signed by me, and uh, then it's up to you to watch it. If you want, copy it. Oh yes, copy it, and copy it, and copy it, and give it to your friends who can copy it, and copy it, and copy it. Let's get lots of copies out there for, at the moment, with this uh, measles outbreak here in the United States, I guess uh, things like this are really needed. And as ever, thank you to the people who uh, show your support for the Skeptic Zone by chipping in with uh, PayPal, and you can do that at the Skeptic Zone website as well. Much appreciated and uh, necessary for the continuation of the show. But now it's time for me to... uh, Hmm, start looking at packing my bags for that long trip across the Pacific. And until next week, where I'll be back in Sydney, Australia, this is Richard Saunders signing off from the San Francisco Bay Area, California. You've been listening to The Skeptic Zone. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for comments, contacts, and extra video reports. (laughs) 